now I'm the substance use disorder program manager at the Alliance. Uh, thanks for joining us for the first webinar in our June series on opioid use disorder treatment in primary care. Um, we have Joshua Leslie here with us today, which I'm very excited about. Um, we partner with him to work with our health centers and expanding their programs for medication for opioid use disorder. Um, so he has extensive experience within the realm of primary care and substance use treatment. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to him to uh, begin our presentation on harm reduction from a provider standpoint. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, if I can get the participant share, um, then I will share my screen. We'll get started. Got disabled by the host. <laughs> so it'll be a four-part series uh, talking about uh, a couple of overarching themes uh, for substance use disorder within uh, rural health centers, uh, primary care uh, areas, and then looking at um, additional assistance with other uh, program areas. So it looks like I can share. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about uh, for this series is gonna be harm reduction. Uh, you know, I, I always uh, lead with uh, this presentation. Um, if there's anything that's ever uh, gained or, or picked up on, um, in any, any educational material that, that I present, it's always around harm reduction modeling uh, and the concepts and the ideas behind it. You know, this can be one of the hardest things. So as a clinician, so I'm a, I'm a practicing clinician. I'm actually, I'm a PA. Uh, I've been in clinical practice for approximately 18 years. Uh, I've been working in psychiatry and substance use disorder throughout that time. Uh, currently, I uh, consult with over, what, 32 clinics uh, across the area. Um, and also build uh, outpatient uh, behavioral health and substance use disorder programs. And this is truly kind of that core teaching element that we are always bringing to the table. Um, it's harm reduction. So what does that mean? We're going to kind of go through that in more detail. Uh, you know, this really, we're going to talk about some guiding principles around it. We're going to talk about some programs around it. Um, but the idea that individuals uh, that are using whether it's illicit or illicit substances, um, and they are not using them um, in an appropriate way, uh, that these individuals need help, that they are individuals, that this is impacting their lives, and that the focus needs to be on improvement of their life, um, not necessarily always around uh, immediate substance use discontinuation. And I think from a clinician perspective, that can be extremely challenging to wrap your head around. You know, some of the stories that, that I tell or what I'm bringing in like new providers and educating them on harm reduction is, you know, I've, I've got patients that will come into practice and I'm seeing them or providing um, individual uh, services on them. And, you know, the patient comes in and we're doing a drug screen, right? And, okay, what's going on? Where are we at? How are things going? You know, they're on Suboxone and they've been stable on Suboxone for, you know, a couple of days now and we're moving through treatment and, and you know, okay, we're going to check another drug screen, see where you're at. And the drug screen shows, you know, positive for, you know, cannabis, um, positive for, um, you know, amphetamines, um, positive for uh, LSD. Uh, and, you know, I've got my, my students with me or I've got my new providers with me and, you know, I'm ecstatic at that result. Uh, and I'm, you know, giving a big congratulations to, to my patients. And, and I've had numerous times where this has occurred. And, uh, and, you know, the, the clinicians that are kind of looking at me like, what are, wh why is that a good thing? Like this drug screen was lighting up like a Christmas tree. Like, why are you okay with this? The point is, is that we're not using opioids and that opioid and that drug screen was negative for opioids. The Suboxone, yes, it was positive for that, but there's no opioids in the system. It's a huge win and opioids are directly linked with overdose and death. These other drugs, yes, there is risk and we're aware of those risks and we discuss and educate on those risks, but we are attempting to reduce the morbidity associated with the use of opioids. 
And so we're just going to talk a little bit about what harm reduction is. People will talk about harm reduction. Oh, I, I practice harm reduction or, oh yeah, I know what it is. But you know, there's, there's some core philosophies and philosophical ideas behind it. There's actually eight core principles and these slides are a little bit wordy. Um, we're more than welcome to give you guys a copy of these slides afterwards, after the presentation. So if anybody has um, a want or a request for that, uh, we'll make sure that you guys get a copy of the slides. The idea, again, is that we're looking to reduce the negative consequences associated with the misuse of whether it's illicit or illicit substances. And it's a true belief and true respect that people that do use or misuse illicit or illicit substances um, have rights. Um, that we demand that these interventions or these policies that are designed to serve those um, individuals are specific to what their needs are and what the community needs are. And that it is a full spectrum of, of resources and a full spectrum of services that are out there. We want safer use. We want to be able to manage use. We can talk about and work through abstinence, but we're really meeting people where they are and where they're at in their treatment. You know, so some of the core principles that we're going to talk about is, and again, I do review these like line by line. I think it's very important to understand the eight core principles of harm reduction. So for better or worse, listen, illicit substance and use is part of the world and that we choose to work to minimize its harmful effects rather than just simply ignoring or condemning it. And that's a lot of what we see in the outpatient world or in the, the PCP world. And, and that's something that I spend a lot of my time working with um, when I go in and work with consulting groups or work in and try to help build and develop programs. It's, you know, it's there, it's within the population that you're treating. And so are we going to ignore it? Are we going to condemn it? Are we gonna open our arms up and say, hey, let's accept it and let's see what we can do to help. And we want to understand that the misuse of these substances is very complex. It's multifaceted. It encompasses a continuum of behaviors from severe abuse all the way down to total abstinence. And it's also acknowledging that there are some ways that using illicit, illicit substances are safer than others. We also want to work to establish the quality of an individual's life and well-being. Quality, not necessarily cessation of all drugs. So our quality of life quality of the individual should be the primary criteria for intervention. And then we really want to focus on practicing non-judgmental, non-coercive uh, provision of services and resources to patients who use the drugs and the communities in which they live in order to assist in reducing the harm. The additional principles that we definitely want to make sure we're addressing is that um, there's a real voice in the creation of programs designed around the patients that serve them. I kind of stop here for a minute and talk about this. Uh, you know, I have um, personally opened uh, several um, uh, OBOT, which are office-based opioid treatment programs, as well as OTPs, um, which are um, opioid treatment programs. Those are like full methadone build-out type programs. Uh, and I, I routinely kind of get stuck in this area. And that what, I, what I'm talking about is that you're trying to build and develop a program and you're not including your patients. And I know it sounds simple, um, but it's not. Uh, and, and I'll give you kind of an example. You know, we were building um, an OTP program a few years back and wanted to focus all of this programming around a newer intervention that's in place uh, and, and work on this different treatment modality. And so, you know, we spent months building the program and building out the materials and putting everything together and had all of the, you know, the higher ups that, that are in the, the um, program, you know, kind of really buy into this and we're, you know, pitching this to our patients and we're getting them enrolled in it. Uh, and they're in it, they're enrolled in it. They're doing all right, right? They're going through the program. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're, making, we're making headway, um, so we think. Uh, and, you know, about four months into the program, we start seeing that there's a reduction in individuals utilizing the program. We can't get people into the program. Um, and I'm actually I'm treating clinically at that time. And I said, hey, like, you know, can I get you in this program? We put a lot of effort into it. And the patient I'm working with said, you know, this really is not what would benefit us. This doesn't really help us. This is a lot of really smart people talking at us, but not actually engaging with what's going on. Uh, and, you know, I really took that to heart and, and looking at that principle, you know, we, at the time we had some peer support services. And so 
I said, hey, I want you to spend some time talking with uh, one of my peer support specialists, and I want you to, to develop a program and what that would look like. So one of our patients, one of our peer support specialists developed their own program. We then launched that in combination with the current program that we have. Uh, and we had like a tenfold increase in participation when it was built by peer support and actual a patient within our program itself. So it's really important that your patients themselves have a voice in the programs and the policies that you're, you're, you're developing and building for them. You know, other areas that we wanted to address is to make sure that we do understand that the patients themselves are the primary agents of change. Um, they're responsible for reducing the harm of their use. We want to empower our patients. We want to share information. We want to support them in their struggles. We want to actually understand and know what actually is going on within their lives and so that we can provide that additional layer of support for them. We also want to have a, a true understanding of the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, trauma, sexual discrimination, other social inequalities that affect our patients' vulnerability to and capacity for effectively dealing with substance-related harm. And then lastly, that our care does not attempt to minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm and danger associated with illicit and illicit substance use. And so the, these are these eight core principles that we really try to build programs around or build our, our clinician perspective around, you know, and I am fully aware that not everybody that's listening today, and honestly, I work with a lot of different groups throughout Arizona, um, in order to build a program like this is a lot of, of effort and a lot of resources, and a lot of commitment that some organizations don't have, and, and I do understand that, and so it's like, okay, what can we do? Where can we start? How can we get things going? And so, Again, yes, this is the, the direction, but we also say, you know, in harm reduction, like something's better than nothing. So let's see what we could do to provide these types of resources and this understanding to our patient population. The next uh, area, um, and actually I can stop for a second. I mean, we'll, 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 typically I hold questions to the end, but you know, um, more than welcome if there are any questions that we can kind of run through on the, the harm reduction at this point. We'll, um, we'll also have uh, plenty of time at the end uh, of each lecture series to, to discuss, to, to talk about things, to go over any questions that anyone might have. So next thing that we want to um, kind of just go over with everybody is to understand some of the resources nationwide and then some of the resources local here in Arizona. And um, also just to educate, to understand that, you know, if these resources are not available in your community, they could be. Like be an active participant, like reach out to legislatures, like try to push and promote these programs to occur. So we'll talk about some syringe service programs or SSPs. We'll talk about overdose prevention programs. Uh, we also talk about medication for opioid use disorder. We'll talk about that in more detail um, in other presentations to come. We'll talk about some safer drug use education and uh, some supervised uh, consumption services, which um, has had a little bit of update here nationally. Now, one of the things I do say like ahead of time after uh, at this point is that I am I am not a paid spokesperson for Sonora Prevention Works, um, but I will mention them several times. So if they're anywhere in this lecture, um, they do a great job. I, I personally have had uh, outstanding uh, support and success uh, working with Sonora Prevention Works, and so they are mentioned several times within this this lecture and in the lectures to come. Um, but again, they're one of the best resources out there in the state. So. First, let's start with the syringe service programs. Uh, the idea is to offer sterile uh, injection equipment um, in a safe location, uh, and that you can also have that area uh, readily available to discard already used needles and syringes. And so why do we do this, right? Why do we create syringe service programs? Well, they are a huge resource for harm reduction, specifically on the medical side. And so these uh, SSPs, or sometimes they're called SAP, syringe access programs, um, they're associated with upwards of a 50% reduction in HIV and uh, hepatitis C uh, incidents. Um, and that's a huge, huge factor. And so, you know, that alone um, creates a substantial uh, harm reduction opportunity for your patients. Um, the majority of these uh, programs also offer education and referrals for things like medication-assisted treatment. Um, 
and the data supports, you know, uh, new users of these programs or new individuals that walk into these programs are five times more likely to enter a drug treatment program and three times more likely to stop using illicit or illicit substances than those who don't use these programs. So we know that they're successful. We know that these programs can really be helpful within the community. You know, as it stands, um, there's, uh, it changes uh, periodically, but about 33 states at this point operate SSPs or SAPs. Um, many cities though, in many states, uh, do not have formal um, resolutions that will allow them to operate. Um, and so that is always the hardest component of bringing these together. And Arizona is actually one of the examples. And so um, in uh, so May 24th, 2021, so literally we're just talking a year ago, uh, Governor Ducey signed a bill decriminalize, uh, decriminalizing SSPs within the state. That's a huge deal. So prior to that, right, individuals that are attempting to use these types of programs could potentially um, be uh, uh, arrested uh, for having needles or for exchanging needles. And so this is something that was a really, really big deal uh, here in the state. And really Arizona of those 33 was one of the later states to formally authorize these SSPs. They've existed as kind of underground movements for years. Uh, and now we're able to have that ability to be more formalized. And when you're able to formalize it and decriminalize it, now you're opening um, opportunities up for state or federal aid to support additional substance use uh, disorder treatment, uh, additional opportunities within the SSPs themselves. And again, you know, Sonoran Prevention Works, really one of the leaders here uh, in the SSP movement. Uh, they continue to make strides to expand the SSP resources across Arizona, and I gave them kind of a, a quick little shout out with their um, website as well. It's a loaded slide. Again, if you guys want to copy, more than welcome. I'm not going to spend you know too much time uh, running through like every single process, but the idea behind it is that the resources. Are, are out there for safe needle exchange, safe needle use, additional education, testing for like diseases like HIV and hepatitis, those types of things. And so, you know, and they've been around for more than 30 years and we're finally at a point in Arizona where it has been decriminalized and that we're able to continue to grow and expand that resource. Uh, next thing we're going to talk about, which again, when we're talking about like clinical care, um, talking on a clinician perspective, talking like right within the PCP practice, uh, FQHC, RHC programs, uh, is, you know, overdose prevention. Um, again, we talk about harm reduction, number one. Number two, we really love to talk about this overdose prevention. And so for us, um, this is naloxone, and these are naloxone uh, distribution programs. Uh, you know, the goal is to have any and everybody able to uh, have naloxone um, at any point in time so that we can reduce the morbidity, the death count associated with um, whether it's intentional or unintentional overdoses. And so as it stands, Arizona is ranked 13th in the country uh, for a highest rate of uh, overdose fatalities with over 2,600 confirmed opioid deaths reported last year alone. Again, kind of the biggest player here in the state is Sonoran Prevention Works. Um, there's also a National Harm Reduction Coalition that engage with community leaders, individuals, and other healthcare agencies to supply naloxone kits to organizations and directly to patients. So for instance, Sonoran Prevention Works, they've uh, distributed well over 650,000 doses of naloxone in Arizona since they started in 2017. Um, they've also uh, been able to report over 16,000 overdose reversals since inception and have trained well over 27,000 individuals on overdose prevention. They're even, and again, I should have actually talked to them ahead of time. Um, for a while there, they, they were also um, offering um, uh, mail delivery of naloxone. Things were a little more challenging with COVID and trying to get the distribution out. And so that was also a viable option. Uh, for them, and I did post that website uh, to um, take a look and see if that's still a, a potential option for obtaining naloxone. I just also want to mention that um, since we do have majority of people on this on this call are from health centers, um, we do have a relationship with the state where we can 
Um, if you're in Maricopa County, I can assist you with getting uh, nasal Narcan for your clinic. And if you're not in Maricopa County, um, we can still assist in that process. And so I'll put that link in the chat. Um, there's an online form that you can submit through the state to get uh, nasal Narcan for your clinic. So SPW is still a great resource, especially for like community distribution. Um, but if you want like large amounts for your clinic, um, you can visit the link that I'll paste in the chat right now. Perfect. Thank you, Janelle. That's great. I will touch briefly today on medication for opioid use disorder. Um, actually, next week's presentation will be uh, much more um, specific around the use of Suboxone. So um, I, again, kind of knowing our audience here, uh, we're going to talk about the primary that would be utilized. So we just talked about naloxone, right, overdose reversal agent. Um, and then within like rural health centers, FQHCs, PCP practices, you're looking at Suboxone, you're looking at naltrexone, and you're looking at Vivitrol. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, none of the, the, the community health programs out there are also integrated OTP, so opioid treatment programs utilizing methadone for the use of opioid use disorder. So really wanna kind of stick to what is going to be used. And again, next week's lecture series will be very specific so like clinicians that are actually prescribing, what does induction look like? What does stabilization look like? What does maintenance look like? Um, and so there's gonna be a lot more discussion on that, but just at least at a high level, um, the, the core area for medication assisted treatment or medications for opioid use disorder uh, are Suboxone and Suboxone is a partial agonist. And what that means, it's designed to in essence block the high associated with you know, street opioids. Um, and it's supposed to have a very long half-life or it stays in your system very long. So it's supposed to be a once a day, uh, once a day medication that holds a patient's withdrawal symptoms and psychological cravings at bay for 24 hours upwards of 36 hours. Um, but it does hit, it's partial opioid agonists. And so it does hit to some extent. And again, it doesn't hit with a high, it hits with like a slow, steady. Uh, and so, um, you can have phys uh, physical side effects or withdrawal if it's not cold turkey. And so that is something that we do educate our patients on and make sure that they're aware. But it is substantially less abused. There's a lower risk associated with its use um, and it can be controlled and monitored um, from a prescriber perspective. The next medi uh, medication that's used a lot of times uh, is uh, naltrexone. So naltrexone is the oral formulation uh, of um, Excuse me, and what it does is it's actually designed to block opioids. So it is a true blocker of opioids. It also blocks the alcohol receptors as well. Uh, and that um, typically where we like to see this is, you know, a patient's in treatment or they're really focused on, you know, full abstinence. Um, this is another area that can help to remove that as a potential risk. Uh, and then if that is working well, if we are seeing benefits on the oral side of uh, naltrexone, we can convert over to Vivitrol. And Vivitrol is the injectable form of naltrexone. It's administered once every four weeks. Uh, there's no withdrawal. It can be stopped suddenly, but then just being aware because it is an injection, it slowly kind of comes out of your uh, system over the next four weeks. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that I know can be really hard on the clinical side is uh, meeting with the patient, and this is real life, right? Meeting with the patient, uh, you know, having some concerns, maybe something's going on, you ask about drug use, maybe they share a little bit, maybe you do a drug screen and you're showing there's maybe a little bit more going on. And then having like a, a real conversation, you know, are you open to treatment? Is that something that you're looking at? Can we get you into programs? What can this look like? And the patient says, no, the patient says, no, I'm not interested right now. Um, I understand that you're concerned. I understand that um, you want to help me, uh, but I'm just not in the right place. And honestly, like 99% of the times that's the end of the conversation. You're like, okay, well, let me know. I have resources or here, let's, let's, you know, talk to you, or maybe I'll refer you to this, or if you are interested, here's a phone number, here's a website, here's this or that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that 
I hope could be a takeaway from, from this uh, lecture is, is every once in a while or every time really trying to have a conversation about like safer drug use, right? So the patient says, no, I'm not interested this time. Um, you see the track marks, right? You're doing your physical exam, you see the track marks, you know what's going on. Uh, and are you able to, to take that next step and have a conversation with the patient around safer drug use? What does that mean? Like, how does that conversation go? You know, as a clinician, I'm documenting, hey, patient is using uh, IV uh, intravenous heroin, has been using, you know, a gram uh, a day for the last two years, is not reporting interest in um, additional outpatient uh, or inpatient detox uh, and rehabilitation services. Uh, and then additional education on safe drug use is encouraged, including using less, using slower, um, injecting just a little bit, especially with all the fentanyl that's going on right now, the overdose deaths are through the roof, um, just a touch to see, to see what's going on, testing the strength before injecting the, the more in, uh, through the syringe. We're trying to convert, right? Trying to convert from injection to snorting or to smoking. Um, the injection carries the highest risk for overdose. Um, don't get me wrong, you still overdose smoking, uh, smoking or snorting, but again, the inhalation risk is lower overall. Um, I, I do a lot of education around trying to get people to space out dosing a little bit, right? Give yourself some time between dosing. Um, you know, patients, again, I'm not sitting here telling patients to um, go into active withdrawal because that is kind of the cycle that occurs, but giving enough space, uh, especially again with the fentanyl side of it, the fentanyl starts to build up and then your risk for overdose goes through the roof. Um, and then trying, trying, trying to educate and to really commit patients to not, um, use alone. Always, always, always trying to use in a group or with another individual. If you are going to use alone, have to make sure somebody knows to check in on you to make sure that there's some way that they can intervene. That's a really important side of it. And then if you are in a group, making sure that you're staggering your use, making sure that someone in the group is always alert and at a minimum, one person within that group does have naloxone uh, with them. I think that's really, really important factor to make sure that someone in that group is always, you know, has something there. Um, and again, be familiar with, you know, and that's something that I would say most individuals are actually um, familiar with what overdose looks like and what, what's going, but making sure that there's that opportunity to have naloxone available. And then kind of the last thing that we're going to talk about here uh, for this series, and we'll open it up for any dialogue or questions that you guys have, is uh, talking about supervised consumption services. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I feel like this is new, because honestly, for the U.S., it is. Uh, but this has actually been around for years and years and years, a lot in, over in Europe. Um, and it's slowly, slowly making its way into the United States. You know, uh, the fact that the syringe uh, service programs are being decriminalized is a big step in the right direction for supervised consumption services. So think about like your syringe service programs as being like the first step. And then the next step, or maybe that next leap, so to speak, is actual supervised consumption services. So these are designated sites, designated locations with staffing where people can come in and use illicit substances and they're in, uh, under the supervision of trained personnel. And so we know what's going on, right? We know everyone's aware of what's happening. And uh, these individuals are able to be monitored closely while they're using. Again, it's been around for over 30 years. There's at least at minimum 120 sites in 11 different countries around the world. And, it's, and really the idea is promoting engagement and referrals to support services, right? And so these individuals come in, they get cleaned up, right? They can use, that's a safe area, it's a clean environment. There's education and resources available to them about housing programs or drug treatment programs, all of those things are there. Um, and there has been some pilot sites that have been tested throughout the United States. Um, there was some uh, decent progress here last year. So in March of last year, New Mexico did pass a bill um, authorizing these uh, SCSs or supervised consumption services as a public health tool. Um, it also provided legislation for legal protections. And then um, just this past December, uh, New York City actually opened one of the first uh, SCSs in the country. Um, and what's really uh, fascinating about these programs is that, you know, within the first five months of this program opening, 
um, they were able to uh, reverse over 270 active overdoses. Uh, and, which I think is really important, zero deaths, no deaths within the facility. Even though overdoses occur with staff training and monitoring and supervision, they're able to successfully reverse every overdose without a single death occurring in the facility. So that's kind of first lecture series, guys. Um, wide open, like I said, for conversations, questions, anything like that. Again, you want a copy of the material, more than welcome to hand that over to you. Uh, my email right there, jleslie at ascendtelehealth.com. Uh, that's a company, I'm the owner of that company. And again, we kind of go in, we help do consultation services for the Alliance, but we also um, help kind of build and grow programs uh, for different federally qualified health centers, RHCs within the state of Arizona, as well as other states. Um, so, you know, any, this is kind of that free opportunity to chat a little bit. And like I said, we've got three more lectures coming and we'll be talking in more detail uh, each time. So again, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Hey, Josh. So yeah. um, one of the questions that came up is who provides supervised consumption sites in Arizona? And Not I didn't yet. think we had <laughs> any yet, but I just yes. want to make sure. Yeah, that's a yeah. big one. We definitely want to push for that. And so we want to push, you know, legislative and change and, uh, you know, honestly, grant dollars and fundings and those types of things. But yeah, we're not, we're not there yet. Like I said, so Arizona is a little bit behind. Um, you know, I do, I want to give credit where credit's due. So, you know, the fact that we were able to have um, the, the bill passed uh, last year for the syringe uh, programs to be decriminalized, that was a great step in the right direction. But yeah, we're just, we're not quite there on the SCS yet. Thank you. And what I just pasted in the chat is um, a video, video documentary, um, cause it's about 50 minutes. Um, and it is on like the fentanyl crisis but it also has like a lot of information on supervised consumption sites. And it shows, um, I guess what I like about it is that it shows like the true reality of those sites and what they do for people. Um, there are participants that speak to what it's done for them and what it continues to do for them. Um, so I, I know that this topic is still somewhat controversial. Um, so if you're looking to just better understand um, those, those supervised consumption sites and their usefulness in the community, I'd encourage you to watch that documentary. I believe that a lot of it is done in Canada. Um, so it's got a lot of really great info and, and is helpful also in showing maybe like people within your clinics, even if you are fully on board with those sorts of services, maybe sharing that with some people in your clinic that are still trying to understand. Yeah, I'm 100% with you. And again, there's some, you know, there's, as we talk to some of the groups out there, you know, there's some underground programs that exist, and they actually exist across the country. Uh, and I know we can't really spend a lot of time talking about those, but um, those programs are out there. Um, you know, we're going to do a lecture series on peer support. Uh, and I'm excited to kind of share some of that information uh, because it's like, well, if it's underground, how do I know about it? Well, you got to have people to know about it. Uh, and one of the best kind of resources that exists is uh, peer support programs, uh, especially here in the state, uh, that are aware of all the ins and outs and some of the underlying things that are out there that maybe other folks don't know about and maybe things that we you know, can't necessarily share or speak of uh, at this point um, from the legal side of things. So, yeah, so we'll continue to kind of some of that conversation and some of that engagement here in the next couple of weeks for sure. But yeah, wide open if there's questions, concerns. I, you know, um, from a group perspective, I like to keep presentations uh, fairly short. I do not like death by PowerPoint. Uh, so I really like more engagement and dialogue. Um, if they're not questions, that's okay as well. Uh, again, I am an open resource. Uh, please email questions. I'm willing to chat with you. 
you know, some of the work I do for the Alliance, I actually, uh, was it just like two weeks ago, I got a phone call from one of the um, PCPs uh, that I had uh, done a lecture series with, and they called me up and they were starting Suboxone for the first time. And so they just wanted to go through the induction. And what does that look like? And making sure that they're doing it the right way and checking everything and making sure it's run correctly. So I'm, I'm truly am like a, a wide open resource uh, for anybody that has questions, concerns, anything like that. And also, I just want to mention that a lot of Josh's services um, are covered uh, under various projects at the Alliance. So even if you're not in Maricopa County under my current project, if you're in another county, um, still reach out just because we may have already kind of started conversations at your clinic. Um, so we can let you know about that. Or if we haven't, we can discuss the possibility of it and we can figure out how we can help to support that work. Um, no matter where you're located within the state, we wanna provide support. Um, and yeah, someone asked if I can email the sites and I can definitely do that. Um, just like a, a list of these uh, websites we've talked about today that I put in the chat, um, Sonorum Prevention Works, Shot in the Dark. Um, both, both of those organizations, like Josh said, they're really good at what they do. Um, they, they can provide clients with other resources, like he was saying that we can't really share about or that we may not know about. Um, those people can connect your clients directly with more services. Um, and, and I can say from experience, I've volunteered with Shot in the Dark um, and the work that they do is really amazing. Um, a lot of people don't really realize the benefits of these programs unless you see them yourself. And, one of the biggest things within those programs that I feel like they do for people is help them to get a sense of community. So if they go once a week to get Narcan and safer use supplies, they have people that they can connect with there and people that they know care about them. And so I mean, that in itself is really big for, for some people who don't really have any support in their active addiction, um, or even just really having exposure to people who are in recovery or people who are helping others um, that can have a great impact on someone. And so um, along with this topic of harm reduction for providers, I, I want to mention that there are like lots of studies and I reference them in Narcan training. So if your your clinic's interested in Narcan training, um, like tailored to your specific site, um, please send me an email as well. But these studies show that when a client receives a naloxone kit from their provider, that they then feel as if they can trust their provider more. Um, there's studies that have been done on it. So they feel they can be more honest with their provider. Um, they feel that they are safer and that they're valued. Um, all of this stuff has been studied. So it's pretty neat, it can have a lot of benefits outside of just overdose prevention. It really builds rapport. Um, when your clinic offers these services, it can help patients who use drugs feel safer in your clinic. So any well, other- Well, and then they're more open. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Thank you, Janelle, because that's, that's really the key clinical element is being open to having dialogue and to at least understanding that it is within your program. And then how do you, you know, really provide those resources and get people to discuss and to communicate it with you so then you can actually provide them the resources that they need. So that's, that's great, I appreciate you saying that. 
And I think that a lot of times, um, based on my experience with people who use drugs, a lot of times they uh, can feel like, what's this person's motive with me, you know? Um, they unfortunately have had people in their lives who uh, have wanted to get things from them. So they aren't very trusting sometimes. And so um, that just is another tool that you have to like strengthen that relationship with patients. Um, whatever model you choose to do, I know Josh, um, probably has a lot of examples of this, but um, peers in your clinic can provide the Narcan um, or the provider can. Sometimes I know MAs provide it to patients. It just depends on what works best with the clinic and the structure. Um, but overall, the message that giving someone the Narcan sends to them is that we value your life and we want you to be here so that you can recover when you're ready. Um, and so I think it's, it's really, community health centers are a really ideal place to provide that because that's kind of what we stand for, right? Is caring for the whole person. Any other questions for Josh, um, feel free to put them in the chat. You can also raise your hand if you have a question and we can do our best to unmute you if you wanna actually ask your question. And then um, I just wanna mention as well that our next um, session is gonna be next week, same time. Uh, 9 to 10, and it's going to be on Suboxone best practice it, within like primary care environments. So Josh has provided tons of support to various health centers, a few of them being NOAA, um, Adelante, Valley Wise Health. He's now expanding some of that into our other more rural clinics. Um, so he has a lot of experience in this area and is a really wonderful resource. So um, please, if you're interested in a needs assessment or um, just talking further about what Josh provides and what sorts of trainings and stuff like that are available, just send me an email and I can let you know. Yeah, next week, guys, just anybody on here, uh, if there's any clinicians, you know, PAs, NPs, uh, PCPs, uh, anybody that's, that's, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, getting their X waiver, thinking about, you know, starting to prescribe Suboxone, or even it's just an idea of, uh, you know, some of the therapists or some of the MAs or anything like that, it's be a good time for them to, to sit on this next lecture, uh, 9 to 10 next week. Uh, we're going to actually get into suboxone itself, um, suboxone inductions, precipitate withdrawal, dosing, kind of the whole nine. So it's going to be definitely more um, true clinician based. And so, uh, again, anybody that might be interested in that, this would be a really good one. I get a lot of really, really solid uh, participation out of this when we're doing it with new training with all my own providers uh, and working with to, to Janelle's, uh, you know, uh, comments, you know, Valley Wise, Adelante, NOAA. Uh, we're doing some stuff uh, down in southern Arizona at this point, and this is one of the big areas that we like to train and develop and make sure providers are a little bit more comfortable with. You know, there was a, there was a push to, to uh, almost three years ago now, uh, where providers were actually being paid a really large amount of money to get their X waiver. Lick got like 5,000 X waiver clinicians in Arizona, and of that, less than 1% actually prescribed Suboxone. Um, so they're incentivized by money to get the license, but then everybody's afraid to use it. Um, so anybody's got X waiver that is afraid to use it, like be at this next lecture, because this is the one that we can walk you through it and educate you on it and make you really comfortable and actually prescribing it. That's all. That's all I got. So please feel free to forward that calendar invite that has all of these uh, sessions to any of your staff that could benefit. Um, 
Elizabeth in the chat had asked for Josh's email. I put that in there. And Elizabeth is from uh, Valle del Sol, so we can definitely provide um, support and um, would love to do that. So, so yeah, if anyone else is interested, send Josh or myself an email um, and we can talk about what options are available for your clinic for us to support. Any last minute questions? We're going to go ahead and end this session a little bit early so you can get some of your morning back. Um, but please, uh, like Josh said, next session next week is going to be really great, specifically for providers. So please uh, come back and join us. And Josh, Elizabeth said, thank you so much, saving lives. In case yes, you feel I love that. <laughs> Thank That's you great. so much. Thank you for everyone uh, for coming. Have a good day.